Richard, if you guys don't mind, we'll go ahead and stand up and worship the Lord.
Oh, God, we love you. That's why we're here, and we're so thankful just to be in fellowship with each other and communion with you tonight, and we are grateful that you are our victor, and because of you, we have victory, and you bring that to life in us. So I ask you to bless our time tonight, and bless Pastor Allen as he speaks to us, and we thank you. We love you, Lord. Amen.
Well, a very good morning to everybody joining us at all of our campuses and everybody else online. Very, very special welcome to anybody in King or at the Stokes Family YMCA that's new with us this morning. We are so glad to be with you. So thankful for Pastor Chuck, all the staff there, all the volunteer leadership. We heard us off to a great launch last week, and we're excited for you. And we're, we're glad to welcome you along with those in Clemens and in Kernersville and everybody else that is uh, going to be joining us online. Are you ready for some good news? Yes. You don't have to worry. Not because your problems are necessarily small, but because your God is so big. He is bigger if we can only see it. We're in a new series we call No Worries, emphasis on no. That really is the biblical exhortation, do not be anxious about anything. No worries, none. That's the whole point of Jesus' teaching. He doesn't want us to worry at all. God's will is for you not to worry at all, no matter how many problems you're facing. But boy, it sure is hard. Have you ever noticed the things you worry about or the things you end up looking for? Uh, I always laugh about the poor husband who... Uh, for 20 years, same story, almost every night his wife would wake him up and say, Honey, I think I hear somebody downstairs. And he said, I, I don't hear anything. Oh, really, really, honey, please go down and check. I can't sleep till you go check. He'd get up, put on his robe, walk down the stairs, look around, come back up, get back in bed and say, There's nobody there. Okay, thank you. Night after night, Honey, I think I hear somebody downstairs. Please go down. I don't hear anything. I think I do hear something. Put on his robe, go down the stairs, look around, come back, get back in bed. There's nobody there. And this went on almost every night for 20 years of marriage. And one night she woke him and she said, Honey, I think I hear somebody downstairs. He said, I don't hear anything. Put on his robe. He went downstairs. And do you know what? He turned the corner, looked through the den, and heading out the back door was a burglar carrying out their TV. And the husband said, Stop! And the burglar, thinking that the homeowner was armed, dropped the TV and put his hands up in the air. And the homeowner said, no, no, I'm not going to shoot you. He said, I just want you to do me a favor. Before you leave, would you mind coming upstairs with me? There's a woman up there that's been waiting 20 years to meet you. <laughs> There's something about what you expect when you worry. You end up looking for it. Have you ever had it happen where there was something that you had in plain view, and yet you didn't see it properly. We like to work the jumble. It's, a, uh, it's just a thing that shows up in the paper, and it's a series of four unscrambled words, and you, you try to unscramble those words, and then some of them have a circle around the letters. You put those together, and then they form a word or a, a series of words that answers the, the puzzle of the day. And so it's basically a game where you're unscrambling these, these words, and we like to work them. Well, one, <clears throat> one uh, occasion, some years ago, uh, Abby and I were trying to work the jumble, and we got down to the fourth word, and we, we just couldn't, we couldn't figure it out, the, uh, the, the letters B-R-E-Y-E-H, and we just couldn't, we just tried every combination of what that could be, B-E-R-Y-E-H. And uh, finally, Abby had to leave, and so I went in, and I said, drive me crazy, we got to come up with this word, so she started working with me on it. And finally, um, she said to me, she said, is Haraby a word? I said, well, you mean like heresy? And she said, yeah. And I said, I don't think Haraby is a word, but she just wrote in Haraby. It was the only thing that we could come up with, Haraby. And so we just said, I don't know what it is. You know, it looked like it fit, but it makes no sense whatsoever. And we put it away. And later, Abby came in, and uh, she was looking back at it again. She said, oh, you got it. And we said, well, yeah, I guess. But we didn't know that was a word. She said, what do you mean it's not a word? She said, hereby. <laughs> you know, like, I hereby pronounce you husband and wife. And uh, we was like, oh, yeah, it's not Haraby. We had the right answer, but we didn't know what we were looking at. Have you ever had something like that before where it's like you're looking at it in plain view, and yet you just can't see it? Well, uh, today we want to look at a story that is all about seeing. It is about what Elisha, the man of God, saw and what his servant saw 
didn't see until he prayed for him, and it's what the Syrian army didn't see and then did see. Because the answer to our worry is not so much us just trying not to worry or pretending that our problems aren't there, but it's seeing God in the midst of it. We are in 2 Kings chapter 6 at verse 8 where we begin. Here's how the story goes. It's a great story. Somebody should make a movie out of this story. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. What was happening was the king of Syria kept planning to attack Israel, but Elisha, the successor of the famous Elijah, was such a powerful prophet of God, and God spoke to him so clearly that he would reveal to Elisha the plans of the Syrian king, and Elisha would go tell the Israeli king about what the Lord had shown him, and they were always avoiding attack, and they were always one step ahead of the Syrians. At verse 11, and the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing, and he called his servants, and he said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, the king of Syria naturally thought there was a spy in their midst, a traitor, a double agent, who was revealing their secrets to the enemy. But verse 12, one of the servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> the whole story, you can starting with this language right here, and, and a lot of commentators will say this, it has just a an almost sense of comedy to it right from the beginning. So this is, an, this is an exaggeration. It's not really to say that Elisha is in there telling the king of Israel, well, you know, the other day, the Syrian king was getting ready to brush his teeth, and he said to his wife, no, it was, that's not what he meant, but he was just saying, he is reading your mail. <laughs> he knows everything about you, this prophet in Israel that was increasingly famous. It's a story about who can see. Verse 13, he said, go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. So he wants, this is the king of Syria, wants to find this prophet Elisha so that he can capture him. But no espionage is needed to find out where Elisha is. Everybody knows he's in Dothan. That's what we learned at verse 13. It was told him, behold, he's in Dothan. So the king sends an enormous army there. Verse 14, he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. So it's clearly overkill. They're going after one man, Elisha, and they're just trying to come and get him. But they come in the middle of the night, and the Syrian king sends this great host of chariots and horses and his great army and surrounds and fills the, the hillsides in the city to surround it. So they're going to go in and capture Elisha. Verse 15, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Alas. The, the, I looked up the word in Hebrew. It is really, ah, <laughs> or aha. It's just like what it sounds like. It is an expression of angst, of worry. He sees the Syrian horses and chariots and soldiers. And once they have seized his vision, he can't see anything else. And that's the way worry works. Once the object of your fear takes over in your mind's eye, it's very hard to see anything else. Some years ago, I wrote a book about remembering God in your life, and I researched how our memories work and how often our memories can become distorted by the way that we see things and the way that we interpret them. And I learned this, that it most certainly is the case that when you expect to see something, you tend to see that. 
it can distort the way you see the world if you have an expectation that you're going to see something. This is the way judgments work. I always uh, chuckle about the, uh, the man who was an inattentive husband and he was always working, never paying much attention to his wife. And she had a terrible day one day. Um, everything was breaking at the house, dishwasher flooding, kids were uh, uh, particularly out of control, one of them was sick. It was just a hard day for her. And, um, <clears throat> and, and so the husband decided to change his ways. And he, he went by the florist, he got some flowers, and uh, he got himself uh, kind of dressed up a little bit and decided to just come and ring the front doorbell and just, you know, he had arranged to take her out on a date that night. And there he was standing, and she opened up the door, and she burst into tears. And he said, well, what? She said, I can't believe it. She said, I've had the worst day I've had in a long time. Everything's breaking. The kids are sick. And now here you've come home drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just can't see something right in front of you because you expected the opposite. And so he sees these, these forces from the Syrian army. He can't see anything else of God in that moment. You know how that feels? You can just feel like you're just, your heart sinks, right? Like what, what, what I think the Bible means is that if your heart melts like wax because it's like all you can see. Part of the problem in the way that we see things is that we tend to just get focused on what has captured our interest, and it can be good or it can be bad. I mean, even if a good thing, it's like if I say to you, okay, envision, if you would, a rose bush, the double delight tea rose bush, the kind that has the big, beautiful blossoms, often in two colors, envision the one that has magenta and ivory into the very, very uh, fragrant rose. You, can you envision that bush? Now, chances are that when you envision that bush, what you're thinking about is the beautiful flower. But I told you to think about a rose bush. <laughs> I bet you weren't thinking about thorns and leaves. Although thorns and leaves are the bigger part of the rose bush. But what was interesting to you, as soon as you get a mental image, was the flower itself. Well, this can work in the converse, that if what captures your interest is an object of worry, then you see that and you don't see other things. This, this is part of the problem, is that we, we focus in on what has captured our interest, and what happens with worry is that what interests us is what can go wrong. It was interesting that really the answer that we're going to see about worry is not to suddenly downplay the fact that there's a problem, but instead to redirect the vision of Elisha's servant to God's presence. I'm always taken by God's motivational speech to Joshua as Joshua is getting ready to lead the people into the promised land. In Joshua chapter one, he first tells him, Moses is dead. The old era is over. Now you're my man. And then he doesn't say to him, listen, taking the promised land is going to be so easy. There's nothing. There's no worries there. There's no problems there. There's no, there's no, no. This is what he says in Joshua 1, 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. In other words, there are going to be a lot of battles. That's what he's saying. Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. He doesn't say you don't need to worry because there are not going to be any problems in the promised land. He doesn't say it's not because there are not going to be any battles there. Instead, of what he says is that you don't have to worry about it because I'm going to be with you. And that means that you can be in the middle of of exceedingly difficult and trying circumstances and have things in your field of vision that you do not understand and are very frightening and yet have your eyes set on the grace of God. Some of you have heard me tell one of our uh, most tender and powerful uh, God moment stories of our life. Our second born, Abby, who is now a junior in college, uh, before she was born, um, Ann and I were at the beach, and um, Ann, who I can't remember what month she was in her pregnancy, but she began to have some symptoms that were troubling, and we called uh, a doctor, a friend of ours, gynecologist, and 
he said, uh, this could be an indication that, that she's miscarrying. And I said, well, should we go? We're at the beach. I said, we don't have a really good facility nearby to go check. He said, well, if you go to the local community hospital, their ultrasound machines may not be that good, and they may, not, they may or may not be able to, to see the heartbeat. So I don't know whether to tell you to go or not. He said, you, and Ann said she wanted to go. Bennett was little, and um, we decided it was best for me just to stay back with Bennett instead of going all together to the hospital. So Ann drove herself. She drove herself not knowing if her second child was miscarrying or not to go and um, be uh, examined and have an ultrasound. And she said while she was driving to the hospital and we were praying, and you can imagine how close at hand worry and angst starts coming, creeping in. And she said while she was driving to the hospital, the Lord spoke to her. She said she heard from the Spirit just as clear as could be that the Lord said, I'm giving you this baby twice. And she took it as a word from the Lord, as a great comfort to her heart. And peace just settled in upon her. Just peace like a river. And you know, sure enough, she went into that community hospital and they went in and the ultimate sound Ultra machine, uh, ultrasound machine wasn't quality, just like my doctor friend had said. And she said it was kind of crackling and buzzing, and they were looking around trying to find the baby's heartbeat. And they looked a long time, and they said, we can't find the heartbeat. And do you know she drove back, came in and spoke to me, and she had such a glow of peace on her face that I assumed that they had found the heartbeat and everything was fine. But do you know, she came back with a greater peace even though the circumstance, the evidence around her had gotten worse. God can redirect your vision so that yes, there's this problem, this symptom, but what you see is a higher truth, God's grace in the midst of it. In other words, we need to see better. This is why Paul was always praying for our vision, our spiritual vision. Like in Ephesians 1 and verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's a spirit of wisdom and revelation he's talking about, things that you see in the spirit, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in these saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Jesus Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. For us to be able to see what God sees would solve all of our worries. I was thinking back this week about a, uh, a great fabled story, a God moment in the, in the history of all the God miracles at Rinalda Church. And one of them was there is a house in the village campus where we uh, house our offices. And we call it the Harper House because it was owned by Mr. and Ms. Harper for many years. And they, uh, they had this, this house that was in a piece of property that was an island in the middle of all our other property. And as we developed a long-range planning committee and we were going to begin some building plans, and initially we thought we would build a, a new uh, large auditorium and we'd, we would need to get that house so we could tear it down and we could build on that site. But they had no interest in, in selling the house. And so years went by and we just prayed about this, that maybe one day they'd be interested, and they became interested. And so uh, we had some series of meetings with Mr. Harper and you know, we kind of danced around what it might take to buy the house. And eventually, having uh, a, a sum in mind that we uh, thought he was saying would buy the house, we went and we decided we we're going to take a huge step, and we offered four hundred fifty thousand dollars for that house. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars many years ago. It was a lot of money. It was a lot of money for our church, but it was essential to our master plan. Essential. We had to buy that house, and. We went over and we offered it to him. I was expecting to shake hands and then we'd start working on the paperwork because we kind of danced around that figure before. 
And he said, well, thank you very much for your offer, but that's not going to buy the house. And we walked out. And I was a very, I was a very young man. I, I, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was fit to be tied. I, I was, I became flustered, frustrated, worried. Uh, one of the elders, Bob Roach, he said to me, he said, "Listen, don't fall on your sword yet, son." And uh, and other stories like, we don't know what the Lord's up to here. And 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 so I tried to calm down and say, "Okay, maybe the Lord's got something else in mind." And you know what happened? Our friends at at, at the school next to the village campus. The summit school, they bought it right out from underneath us. And at first I was really angered about that and I was all worried about it. What have they done? But they bought it for one reason. They wanted to actually do a land swap with us. And they knew that we wanted that. And uh, that was all fair. That if they had it, that we'd be likely to swap some of our land that they needed to build a new drop-off area for summit school. Long story short, we worked out a swap of land. We gave them some land that we didn't need. And we ended up getting the property, and we got the house for free. And we didn't know at the time that actually we never have torn that property down because we became multi-campus, and we've just housed our offices in there for nearly two decades, I guess. And the Lord just had a huge blessing of saving our growing church, whose finances were very important for our continued growth for the kingdom and saved us $450,000 and gave us everything that we needed. I'm just trying to learn, the more that I walk with him, to take a little time before I fall into so much angst and just see if I ask the Holy Spirit to open up the eyes of my heart that maybe I'll be able to see what God is doing in the midst of of the hillsides being surrounded with the Syrian forces and horses and chariots, God might be doing something. And so it was that this servant is so worried, and uh, Elisha prays for him, open his eyes that he may see. Open his eyes. Please, Lord, that he may see. Notice he did not pray, Lord, wipe out the army. He didn't say, just help us not worry. Instead, he said, let my servant see. So, verse 17, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. He opened up his spiritual eyes in this prophetic moment, and his servant saw what Elisha had been seeing the whole time. It's such a cool thing. I mean, in other words, this is basically what happened. Uh, Elisha, the servant, they get up in the morning. The servant goes out, fixes the coffee, goes out to get the morning paper, looks up, and the hillsides are just covered with Syrian forces. And he goes, ah! Elisha's on the same front porch looking at the same scene, and he's not worried one little bit. Takes a sip of coffee because what Elisha sees is God's forces, blazing chariots of fire, and horses and angels, and God's grace just teeming through the hillsides. And he realizes his servant can't see it. Elisha's the only one that sees it. And he says, Lord, let him see. Let him see what I see. It's the same prayer that Jesus, the true Elisha, would later pray for us, that we could see. Reveal to them what you've revealed to me. And so he sees. And it's a powerful, amazing thing if you can just Know that God is right there in the midst of your hardest time. Anne reminded me, because she keeps a folder of of these God moment stories, and she reminded me as we were talking about this text, I'd forgotten this note. I I wrote a book some years ago called Shame Off You, and um, I think the nicest note I ever got was from someone who hadn't read it. (laughs) I want to read it to you. It was written to me in 2010. Dear sir, you don't know me. 
and I'd never heard of you before this evening. What I have to tell you almost sounds crazy and untrue, but I believe in God, and he spoke to me tonight. I own a garden center, a florist, in Midland, Texas, and until four weeks ago, I owned it with my husband. He died of cancer on January 3rd. As I was closing the store today, the first day that I had to run the store completely alone, the phone rang. I knew it was close to 5.30, closing time. On the other end of the phone, a man's voice asked when I closed. I said, I just did. He said he only needed one rose, and he was close by. So I said, well, come on, I'd wait. And as I hung up, I thought maybe that wasn't so smart. I mean, it could be someone who was able to know I was alone. Maybe somebody was wanting to rob me. But I got the rose ready, and he came through the door. The sale was $3.25. He handed me $6 and said to keep it. I pushed it back, taking only what I needed. I told him it was no big deal waiting on him. And how could I stand between whomever was to receive the rose? And as I said it, tears welled up in my eyes. And he turned to leave, paused, and looked back at me. And he said, I'll be back. God told me to bring you a book. I said, excuse me? He said, God told me to bring you a book. It's called Shame Off You. And by this time, I was crying. I asked him if he knew me, if he knew my situation, if he'd ever been in my store before. He said, no. I was in shock. He then asked if he could pray for me. And he took my hands in his and he prayed. And he prayed for me to know that the decisions that I was making in my life were of God and that what other people thought didn't matter. Amazing, she writes. God's awesome. You see, I had been in agony trying to make decisions about my business. My husband was my partner completely. You can't pay anyone to take his place. And it's clear that I can't run it alone. While my husband was sick in the fall, an old friend I hadn't seen in 25 years contacted me. And he heard that my husband was sick and just wanted to offer any help he could. He was available to come and help me keep the store open. Tom and I discussed it. And, and I felt stubborn about running the business alone. And she goes on to tell about the problems that she'd had. And the times she thought about throwing in the towel. And she said... I've been worried about it all. And then that night, she writes, the gentleman said he promised to bring the book to me, your book. And I can't wait to read it, she said. But no matter what it says, it's already changed my life. I'll always wonder who visited me tonight. Did someone really receive that rose? Was he an angel? God? Jesus? My sweet Tom? I'm not going to spend a lot of time questioning it, she writes. I feel honored to have been visited by whomever he was. I know he was of God. Thank you for writing it. God bless you. I never heard from her again. But what she was going to find out is that if she'd read a few chapters into that book, there's a chapter called A Rose for a Rose. And it's a story how one day we hand out our individual rose to every woman in our church. And I wonder what God did when she read that. I just think that God is with us right now at this moment for whatever it might be in your life that you're facing that feels like a Syrian army on the hillsides. And he has a capacity to just open up your eyes in an instant and show you definitively, definitely, that he's with you. And he loves to do that. The answer to our worries is not us pretending that we don't have armies on the hillside. The answer is to see the chariots of fire, the angels of God, and the power of His grace. Well, the story it just is great. I, I tell you, somebody should make a movie about this. 2 Kings 6, 18. When the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. Remember, it's a story about what you see. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. So here's a reversal. The servant was blind to the heavenly chariots, and now the Syrians... They who have been blind to these heavenly chariots, they can't see anything. And it's interesting in Hebrew, this word for blind is not used very often in the Bible. And it's actually connected weirdly to a word for light. So it could be some scholars think that they were blinded by a glorious light. I don't know. But they, they, they couldn't see. 
And so Elisha took advantage of the situation. It's almost comical. It really is comical. 2 Kings 6, 19, Elisha said to them, this is not the way and this is not the city. And so he steps in as if now he's leading this huge army of the Syrians who can't see anything. And they, all of a sudden they have this voice saying, you're in the wrong city. You're in the wrong place. He basically saying, the man you come to seek is not here. <laughs> Ironically, the man they come to seek is now leading them. And they start following him for 12 miles. He leads them up to Samaria, which is where the Israeli army is waiting on them. He just leads them right into the, the trap. And, uh, and, and, and they're surrounded by the Israeli army. We come to verse 20. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So all of a sudden now the Lord opens up their eyes and they can see. And what they see is that, behold, they're in the midst of Samaria. And so what a story because the chariots of fire that were on the hillsides that Elisha and then his servants saw, they never battled against the... They never even did warfare against the Syrian army. Instead, just suddenly the Syrian army couldn't see, but Elisha could see, the servant could see. And so they must be just laughing as they're leading them up into Samaria where now they're surrounded by the Israeli army. If we were to read on the story, it's very fascinating. In fact, what the king of Israel ends up doing under Elijah's counsel is they feed the army who are just completely humiliated that they have just walked in this horrible trap, and then they just let them go. And the text says the Syrians didn't invade them anymore. <laughs> what a story. Elijah and then his successor, Elisha, were thought of as the great... Miracle men of the Old Testament. In fact, when Jesus was calling out on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, some people thought he was calling for Elijah. At the Passover feast, the Jewish people would keep an open seat in case Elijah would return. Elijah and Elisha were legends in the mind of all of Israel, and Jesus came. And he himself is the true Elisha. And he is the one who opens our eyes to see what we can't see. So this is the story of the Bible. It says that the God of this age, the devil, had through the sin of every human being had exercised a kind of lordship in which the God of this age, the devil, had blinded the hearts of everyone. That we are born in sin. And what happens to us, therefore, is that everything that we see is clouded through our own perspective of sin. And so we're prone to worry. We're prone to see the negative. We're prone to have our, our vision distorted. And we're like a people stumbling about in darkness. We're the people that are blinded. We're the people that can't see. And here's the love of God. God loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son to be the word who becomes flesh for you. To reveal his glory as the one who's full of grace and truth. Jesus came so that God would come near and you could see the truth. And Jesus would say, I am the light of the world and whoever follows after me will never stumble in the darkness again. What he's done for us is to, to, to reveal himself to us. When you come to Christ in faith, what happens is a miracle. You have your heart awakened. You have what was blind, what was asleep awakened and now is able to see the grace of God. And what happens there for a Christian is that you become a new creature and the old is gone. And now the Bible says anyone who is a child of God is led by the Spirit of God. What it means is that for every single Christian, it's part of your inheritance that you can hear the voice of God and that you have the mind of Christ and that you can see through the lens of the grace of God and you can look at all of life through the lens of the Bible and you can have the Holy Spirit whisper to you in the time of trouble, do not worry. And then open your eyes to see the amazing provision of God. Jesus is the true Elisha. 
And so he came and he said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't worry. In my father's house, there are many rooms. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'll come back to take you to be with me where I am. I am the way and the truth and the life. If you want to quit worrying, it's hard to pull it off by just saying, well, those Syrian troops on the hillside don't look so bad. That's not really the biblical approach to conquering worry, to say, well, I don't think those bad things and adversities will really come my way. Eh, Probably most of the things we worry about, they never do come to pass. But if they do, if they should, if the army is there, that's where God meets you and says, do not worry. I want to open your eyes to the hillsides. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. That's how you can have no worries. That's the gospel. Father, we're so grateful to you that even right now you can open up our spiritual eyes.